today we're starting a new section. I mean, a, a new subsection um, from 159 to 165. This is the last subsection uh, about the gods. And it's about the orders of the gods, not according to their functions, which is what we saw in the last propositions, but according to the kind of beings they produce. Right, so say that there are intellectual gods, which are the ones that produce news. So they're the cosmic gods, they are the ones that produce the world. Um, but so those specifically are one sixty-two to one sixty-five, and we might get to them today. Um, depends how cryptic the first three are. So one fifty-nine is a general proposition about these orders. And then 160 and 161 are about um, divine noose and being itself. And it's unclear why they're here. Um, maybe just because being itself and divine noose come up when he's discussing different kinds of gods. But I don't really know what they're doing here. So okay, uh, let's just start with 159. Mm-hmm. If you don't like to read the title. Yes. Every order of gods. That's where. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's 159. Yeah. Every order of gods is derived from two initial principles, limit and infinity. But some manifest predominantly the causality of limit, others that of infinity. Okay. Thanks. So we've met limit and infinity before. Right. So infinity is the primary power. It's the cause, it's the origin of there being any causality at all. And limit is what together with infinity produces being, right? All being is a mixture of limit and infinity. Some people, like Dodds, think that this is actually about the functions of the gods that we just saw. And they think this because, for instance, in 157, he's talking about the demiurgic and the paternal causes, and he says, for both these causes are ranked under the principle of limit. And also, previously, when he's talking about the generative gods, he says that it mirrors infinitude. Um, but I think that this is about the different orders of gods that are responsible for the different levels of being. And the reason for this is, is that in other places where Proclus discusses limit and infinity, um, in the Parmenides commentary and the Platonic theology, he discusses how they're present on every level of being and how the mixture is different in each case. And, you know, the higher levels of being have more limit and the lower ones have more infinity. So, for instance, um, news has more limit than soul. Soul is more has more of a mixture of infinity than uh, than news, because infinity is the principle of power. It's also the principle for any kind of multiplicity. And as you go down, you get more and more multiple. Um, and this has also been uh, like there's a. Byzantine commentator of Proclus, very hostile, called Nicholas of Methoni. And um, Proclus and Dodd's comment, uh, quotes him in his commentary, where he, he said from this, wait, how can the gods be simple if they're made out of these two principles, limit and infinity? However, that's um, a careless reading of the text because it's clear here that the question is the orders of the gods, not the gods themselves, right? And, and again, we can apply to the order of the gods what's been said previously about one god being generated from another, that it's not the one hand that generates another immediately, but one hand that generates the, um, the product of the other, the being that participates the other. And, and in that case, we can understand why all the orders of the gods would, in some sense, derive from limit and infinity. All the orders of the gods are distinguished, or each order of the god is distinguished by the being it produces. All beings are mixtures of limit and infinity, and so they all derive from limit and infinity. Um, so that's, so that much commentary 
on the title. And then it's unclear. Are limit and infinity themselves, each of them a henad? That's possible, in which case they would be prior to all. Um, all the other henads, at least with regard to the constitution of being. But another reading is the Butlerian reading. Limit just means a god. Infinity means the power of a god. And if limit and infinity are supposed to be separate gods, it seems like they don't get individual treatment in the Platonic theology. Um, that much, yeah. So there's there are questions here. Okay. Okay. You um, didn't say which ones have more infinity and less, right? No. Um, and in the um, in the argument, he also won't tell us. You can um, read the argument now, and we'll talk about that. Okay. So the argument is like this. Um, for every order must proceed from both because the communication of the primal causes extend through all derivative ranks for position 97. I don't know. 97 was. That was years ago. Um, but At some point, so he's saying since limit and infinity are the primal causes, everything has to have both. Since everything has something of the ultimate cause that caused it. Right. It's because everything. So this 97 says that um, um, whatever something is, it gives it in a, in a derivative way to everything it causes, right? To all the lower, um, all the lower things. And since, and so he applies this um, to limit and infinity and says, well, they're the very first causes, so everything is going to have some share in them. Mm -hmm. So that's just the general argument. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then... But at some point, limit is dominant in the mixture. At others, infinity. Accordingly, the results, he didn't prove that or something. Accordingly, the results, one group of determinative character in which the influence of limit prevails. Okay. And another characterized by infinitude in which the element of infinity preponderates. Yeah, so he hasn't, um, uh, yeah, and this uh, prevails or preponderates is just um, Dodds using different verbs to make the English more colorful. Um, it's the verb in both cases is krate, which means to dominate, to be more powerful than. Um, the... He doesn't give an argument here for why they shouldn't be equally, you know, equally mixed in everything. Um, um, my guess is, however, that so that the distinctions between the different levels of being come from. Um, how unified they are, and so how how much of limit they have, and correspondingly how much of infinity. So if everything had the same mixture, everything would be just the same thing, it would just be the same kind of thing. So, and you see this like when Proclus in other texts talks about, for instance, how um, intellect is eternal and unchanging and always thinks the same things. Whereas the whereas souls they think one thing after another and they think different things and sometimes they're in bodies and so on, he says, well, this is because you know intellect is more of the kind is more limited than the uh, soul. So um, that might be a reason. Now, why would there be different? 
relations in them? Well, ultimately, I guess you would have to push this all. I mean, ultimately, for whatever thing, whatever you explain, you have to push it up all the way to the gods. And so you've we've seen that each god is a henad, that is, it's a unity, it's a measure of beings also. And so the you might want to say, well, the different if each of them is a unity, but each of them is a particular unity, they're all not the same kind of unity. So they don't all you know, they're going to produce a mixture of limit and a, a different mixture of limit and unlimited. Um, why is this difference in terms of quantity unclear, but that there should be quantitative relations between them is given by the fact that he wants to use this like more universal, more particular, higher, lower to talk about them. Um, so you're right that there's not an argument here. I think one can start to construct some, and I think it's interesting. Like we, and I think it's a, an interesting exercise to try to figure this out. Um, but, but yeah, and it's because he doesn't here clearly say, say what he means by one preponderating or one dominating or the other. Um, that's why there's this division amongst uh, scholars. Is he talking about things like paternal and fertile, the things that he was talking before, or is he talking about like being a cause of being or being a cause of an intellect, the things that come after? So that's why there is this debate, because he doesn't explain it here. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll get to those things, the different kinds of um of henads because of the different kinds of beings they produce starting in 162. Before that there's 160 and 161. Uh mm -hmm. do you want to go to 160? Yeah. Just one thing when so if I understand correctly, infinity is here always something like I mean is infinity the furthest thing from unity? Because like unity is one and infinity is everything, um, infinite amount of things or? Um, no, so infinity here is pure power, right? It's the primary power. And it's not an infinite number of things. Um, it, if limit is each thing being in itself, or so it's like the idea of being in oneself, being oneself. Um, infinity is being in another, and or another being in you. The things that are more multiple have more the kind, have a greater share in infinity, I take it, because they are more, they have more causes in one sense, although that's not true about everything inferior. Um, I don't know, so we saw previously that there's this analogy between passive potency and active potency. Perfect potency is you, you know, being in another thing, so, when I use a magnifying glass to burn a, a blade of grass, um, the and I mean, it's ultimately the sun is burning it. So where does this change happen? It happens in the blade of grass. Somehow the heat, the sun, the light is in the blade, right? So um, there you have the, the, what has a perfect power is in the thing with an imperfect power, right? The thing that can be in another is in the thing that can receive another. And so the very primary power is perfect. It's this being in another, not yet being 
um, being able to receive another, but the totally, you know, the total power to be in another is mirrored by the thing that's the ability to receive other things. Um, and that's prime matter, right? The thing that can receive any determination is prime matter. And, um, and there, there isn't yet here an account of why um, why that's so need to move from here to an account of why prime matter is the most multiple thing is the one with the least limit or unity. Well, it's it has no essence of its own. And so it doesn't, it participates least in limit. Whereas the, the prime power, it has some essence of its own because it can be in other things. It is another thing, so other things are in it. Um, so we have here a, mo a motion from less limit, uh, from more limit to less limit. Um, uh, so maybe to just go back to your question, the infinity here is power. It's not infinite in number, but Proclus thinks that infinity in number um, derives from power. Um, the only infinity in number that Proclus recognizes is either the potential infinity, things can always be broken up into smaller bits, but you never get an infinity, or infinity in time. Um, there are infinite amount of generations. But anyway, though both of those kinds of infinity depend on the prime power. Um, there should be a way to construct an argument to show how you get from one to the other. So the infinity here is the passive potency? No, no, it's the, it's the perfect potency. But the passive potency is generated by the passive. Uh, the, the, the passive is generated by the perfect. So I'm confused now. So how does the... So then how does the lower things have more of it? Um, I think perf I think the answer is that the perfect potency is potency that's united with limit. So if you say that there's more potency and less limit, then you're actually saying that the potency is passive. Um, I see your confusion because you would think, well, shouldn't be the thing where it dominates most be most like it's be most like itself. Um, but here we're talking about power, which is something paradoxical because it's it the character of infinity is to be in something else. So actually, when it mo when it is when it dominates the most, it is least itself. Um, I understand this might not be the this might seem like wordplay, um, but it's the best I can do for now. Or maybe let me think about this in a different way. Um, so the causes of all things are the gods. And amongst the gods, there's each of them is a unit and somehow they are all in all. This in this being all in all, all the gods being all in all, in all the gods somehow, that is what is that is in infinite power of the gods, and it's the primary infinity, it's power of the soul. Um, and but hmm. yeah, I don't. No, I don't. I think I I was just about to repeat what I had just said with different words. So, um, 
I think it's ultimately this that the So let me put it this way, power in, or infinity being in something else is the principle of multiplicity because for you to have multiplicity, you have to have many things together. So you have to be have, have many things in another thing or one thing in another. You, if each thing is alone and by itself and absolute, you're not never going to get a multiplicity. Um, and so in that sense, when when it dominates the most, you'll get the greatest multiplicity. Um, but it is not in itself the idea of, of multiplicity or it is not itself um, uh, a really existing infinite multitude. Hmm. So the infinity that we're talking about here is something like the 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 first infinity and he's saying that in places where there's more things somehow there is more of that not really like it's somehow sourced in more than that, more of that does that make sense uh, what did you say after not really the lower things will be said to be uh, originated ori like sourced originally in uh, more of in more of infinity than in limit yeah uh, but they are not they don't have themselves more infinity and limit no that's that's a good way of um, of thinking about it so the lower things they are more caused more by infinity but it's not that they have more infinity in them so let's like think about a, one succession of things for instance so noose is eternal that it's like completely present in all its parts it has no past no future just is and then the souls already exist in time they have infinite time before and after whereas the Noose is always in the now, but souls don't have parts in space. They're, all their parts are together. All their powers are together. But then bodies already have different parts in space. and You can keep cutting them up infinitely. Um, and, and there's an infinite power here. You know, when I say you can, you can keep cutting them up infinitely. That that's a that's a potentiality. And when I say that, you know, um, soul has you know acts in time, so it has an infinite past and infinite future. Again, that's not given. That's an infinite power. So as you go down, you get more things that are merely potential, and these and these potencies are always can always be you know extended further and you have less things that are actual and um and so and but furthermore prophets thinks like that the the infinite the perpetual existence of the world depends on souls which depend on noops to always keep thinking um and and so the sources of this infinity are going to be not in the in the in, infinite thing. So the lower things are both more infinite, but they're also, so to speak, more detached from their causes. Right? They, that's something that we saw in that proposition about how the lower you go in the hierarchy, the more something is um, you know, connected to its immediate effects and the further away it is from its causes. So you know, the bodies are immediately formed by their forms. So um, there's an immediate connection between the parts of this computer and, and its form that's making it work, but it is further away from its ultimate causes. So that could be, um, um, so that's right. 
the lower things are more a product of infinity, but they have less infinity in them, something like that. Um, the the lower this has to do with this idea of also of, of self sufficiency, right? Things that cause themselves are self sufficient, but then after, but but the things in this world they don't cause themselves. This the world as a body doesn't cause itself, and and so it doesn't have its causes in it. It doesn't have a, an an intrinsic relation to its causes, um, and uh, and so in some sense it's more. Um, dependent in the literal sense of hanging on, right? It's, um, there's, yeah, that's, um, yeah, it's more contingent, you can say. Um, does that help? Sort of. Okay. Um, we can come back to this maybe when we're going down through 162 to 165, and we can ask in each case, okay, hey, how, how, what kind of mixture of limit and unlimited do we have here? Or limit and infinity. Um, now in 160, we're gonna go to, it's gonna be something that changes the subject. It's gonna be, be about divine intelligence, divine news. The only way to, I can make sense of this is that, well, he's gonna, be, he hasn't talked about divine news in a while and he's going to in a bit. And so he wants to recall this. Or I can just throw my hands up and say, it's an incomplete text. It's not perfectly ordered. Um, so why don't you read the title of 160? Yes. Uh, 160 says, all divine intelligence is perfect and has the character of unity. It is the primal intelligence and produces the others from its own being. Right. Um, so here, the, the main thing is, right? So like every intelligence that belongs to a God, right? So divine intelligence is an intelligence that participates in a henad is an unparticipated intelligence. To say primal here is the same as saying unparticipated. Um, so it's going to be something that, it's going to be an intelligence that somehow characterizes what intelligence is or what soul is or what the body is. It's going to be something that um, defines a new thing. In that sense, it's going to be unparticipated. And it's going to produce other um um intelligences right um so and having the character of unity here well every intelligence is one it can be that uh having the character of unity here like what's special like how is it specifically divine it could be that it is somehow unique right it's a unique um kind of providence a unique way of a unique way of seeing the world. So I talked about how the um, each intelligence, we'll come back to this when we start talking uh, in the section about intelligences, about no ways, that each news is like a separately existing metaphysics that makes itself known. But um, so here it might be that it's it's unique, as opposed to, for instance, um, daimonists, right? Daimonists, they are also each an intelligence, but they're just articulating, implementing things that God um, that a God has first already established. So maybe the Henoe Des here has something of that uniqueness of the gods. Um, so um, let's uh, let's read um, read the first uh, line. Okay, so. <clears throat> For, but this is not talking about the God itself, right? It's talking about the intelligence of yes. the God, something yeah. like that, which is not all of the news. 
Like there is no. some news that are not divine. Yes. Like my news. Like your news. Your news is not only not divine, it also doesn't exist by itself. It's a property of your soul. It's a power of your soul. But also um, spirits, diamonds, that mediate right. between us. Yeah. Um, four. If it is divine, it is filled with divine hennets. I don't know what that means. And it has the character of unity we did that. And if this is so, it's also perfect, being full of the divine goodness. Right. We have this like and add unity, goodness, perfection, which is a kind which is goodness, I think. I'm not sure. Um, right, yeah. So the you're right, he he he's doing this thing of oh, if if it's one, then it's good. Right. And that and that's where perfection comes in. And that has to do with the identity of unity and goodness. Mm -hmm. Now this now you asked, I had I don't know what this means, being filled with divine hen ads. It is puzzling. So, right, how can a divine henad be in a noose, right? Um, get superior to it. So one way is to say, you know, the filled is um, with, it's like it participates in the divine henads and the divine henads produce a power in it, right? We saw before this idea of the, that, you know, the soul isn't itself in the body, it creates this vitality that animates the body, right? There's a proposition 89, I think, it's about things that are separately participated, right? And it talks about how they Im implant a power in the, um, in the thing, uh, 81, sorry. They, they implant, Im implant a power in the participant. Or it could also be not even the direct implantation of something from the divine henads. It could be something, for instance, from the being that immediately participates in them. That would make more sense because the the noose, you know, it knows being. Its relationship is primarily to being, not to the henads. Um, something interesting is this talk about filling, right? And being filled. It's something that Proclus does a lot. But it's also something that, um, so there's a metaphor here, like a, a, a vessel that needs to be filled. And it's, it's a metaphor that's used by Husserl, right, by in phenomenology, to talk also about our, our intentions, right, our, our intentional attitudes. And so, for instance, um, I have an, an idea that things are in a, I'm sorry, I have a, um, I have a perception that I'm talking to you and then we can talk about whether this perception, this intention is filled or not right uh, whether what is given to me um fulfills um what is projected in this intention um and husserl says that what is evidence is when there's a perfect correspondence between the two and you can think about so when we make a mistake or when we think about something that's not real there's nothing that responds to our idea and it is, so to speak, empty. It's not full, filled. Um, plus, well, I mean, 20th century, it's much later than the, um, uh, than Proclus. And I don't know if he has any influence here, but it could be that Proclus has some, something similar in mind. The, the metaphor is already used in Plato in a negative way when uh, he says um, teaching someone is not like pouring wine from one bottle into another. Um, but it could be that the problem there is that the wine, these are material things. But so when he's saying that um, noose is filled with divine henads, it's not just the, you know, well, what I'm getting at is that this is not just saying that A is caused by B, that noose is caused by the divine henads, 
but also that in some sense it intends them. You know, it it nooses knowledge, knowledge of what knowledge of the gods, if it's a divine noose, right? And and then so the the um, it is filled by um, by the gods in having them as its object, either because they produce um, participations of themselves in the noose or via the being that depends on them. Um, so to give you an example, the, um, the sun is a god, and the sun has a soul and a noose and a head. And so how is the noose of the sun filled with um, the, the divine henads? Well, in some sense, it you know, it's it is a knowledge of that um, uh, of that henad that makes itself known to him. Um, that you know the, that henad has the form of light or something immediately dependent upon it, and this then um, is what is expressed, articulated by the news. Um, okay. Okay, something, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I see that. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. It's. Um, yeah, I'm a bit tired today. No, oh, it's okay. Um, okay. okay do you want to continue? But, mm -hmm. um, but if it has these properties, so unity and perfection or goodness, then it is also, or it is also primal as being united with the gods. Primal meaning like causality in the first yeah well, being the first of a certain kind of thing being primary um you can um recall uh maybe you can't recall but i'll uh, point us to that so in proposition 100 there was this argument that everything that's unparticipated um, because it's unparticipated and it's the beginning of, an, of a series, participates in the one, which is the beginning of everything. And and so here, you know, if it if it has these properties of being divine, of being like the one, here it goes the other way. If it has these properties of being like the one, then it's also primary. Right. Okay. Uh, For the highest intelligence is divine divinized the talent intelligence. Right. And being the primal intelligence, it bestows by its own act substantiality upon the rest. For all that has secondary existence derives its substance from a principle which exists primitively. Right. So the bestows substantiality here is just existence, hypostasis, and he is drawing on this yeah, really general principle back from 18 that um, anything that produces by, hmm, I don't know actually if 18 is really um, proper here. It would be better would be something like proposition 21 uh, that every monad gives rise to its own uh, number, right? Or series, but um, I mean, 18 comes explains only this thing by its own act, right? So by being itself. Um, but the, yeah, and, but, but 18 doesn't immediately say that everything that is primary produces the secondary things. That's in 21. For instance, or twenty-four, the unparticipated produces the participated, or twenty-five, everything that's perfect produces other things. Twenty-five, the perfection, uh, the thing that everything that is perfect produces, um, could be also an explanation for why he emphasizes perfect here. 
in this proposition. Um, and okay, so that establishes that all the divine that every divine intelligence is going to be some something that articulates a a new kind of being, right? It's going to be the use of a unique and new kind of being, new in the level, in the in the hierarchy of being, in the causal chain. Um, One sixty one is going to be about true being. So the object of of divine uh, of intelligence and of divine intelligence, um, or rather, that's a bad way of putting it. I mean, saying that it's the object explains what the connection between 160 and 161 is. However, we'll see in discussing 161 that it's not so much an object as a cause. This true being would be primary being, and it would be the sum, in some sense, of all these primary beings that are each of them attached to the gods. Um, so why don't you, I mean, you can call it the sums, so like the whole, or you can think of it as the whole before the parts, just being itself that is prior to all the individual, uh, all the particular beings that are attached to the gods. Mm -hmm. um, in, I'll ask you to read the, the title in a moment, but just about the first words, all the true being, that also in English is has two meanings right it can be every instance of the true being or it can mean the totality of the true being taking it all as one thing and i think it's better here to think of it as one thing the totality of the true being um so read the read that um, sentence 161 okay all the true being which is attached to the gods is a divine intelligible and unparticipated. Okay, so we're gonna see, so which it's attached to the gods, I talked about that right now, but intelligible here, that's a translation of noeton, it's a uh, typical translation, but we'll see in the body of the text that there's actually no intelligible content. It is not that there is something there to be known in true being, but it's called intelligible simply by causality, simply because it produces the content of intelligence, not because it itself has content. But um, we will see that. And that's like, that's also why I prefer translating this noeton here, not as intelligible as something we could know, but rather as intelligized in the sense that there is, it becomes known in noose so it is intelligized there it is you know made into something um of of intelligence but it is not itself something with which we could know um so but we'll see that come up again in the in the argument okay mm -hmm. uh so why don't you read the first paragraph okay um All the true we did that, right? All the true being all the true being which is attached to the gods is a divine intelligible and unparticipated. Four. Four. Since true being is, as has been shown, the first of the principles which participate divine and unification. And since it makes the content of the intelligence, for the intelligence too is an existent, a cause filled with being. So the result that true being is a divine intelligible, divine as being divinized, intelligible as the principle which gives content to the intelligence and is participated by it. Okay. So one thing at a time. True being is, as has been shown, the first of the principles which participate divine unification. So that was 138, building all the way back on, on 101 to 103. So there, you know, he argued that life is more universal than news and being is more universal than life and, and and being is the most universal thing 
And so that's why, uh, and being is the most universal unparticipated principle. Every unparticipated principle participates divine unification. So it's the first thing, uh, participates divine unification, meaning participates in subhanad. And so being is the first of those. So that's what makes it divine. On the other hand, it makes the content of intelligence. So here, for the intelligence it too is an existence because filled with being. So again, existent here is Dodds' translation for on is intelligence. So more correct intelligence too is being because filled with being. So um, intelligence, it doesn't lose. It doesn't make known something outside it, but rather it's, it is its own being that it makes known. So if intelligence makes things known, it's because it is itself is already a being and that's the content. It surely results that true being is a divine intelligible. So divine, because he argued since some participated, it has to have a, uh, a hanad for a cause. And intelligible as the principle which gives content to the intelligence and is participated by it. So not because it there is some content in it, but only because it gives the content to the to intelligence by giving it its um its being. Um, so that's that's what this first um, thing argues. It's the it's a divine intelligible. Um, and now he's going to argue that it's unparticipated. There is a certain circularity here because 138 de depended on it being unparticipated because for it to be a principle which can participate divine unification using the language here, it has to be a, um, it has to be unparticipated already. But nonetheless, let's take a look at the next paragraph, even though there's a, it, it's just a separate argument for it being unparticipated. Okay, and while the intelligence is in existence because of primal being, this primal being is itself separate from the intelligence because intelligence is posterior to being. Again, right, that we know that already, right? From 101, no, I don't remember. <laughs> And again, unparticipated terms subsist prior to the participated. So that prior to the being, which is consubs consubstantial with the intelligence, there must be a form of being which exists in itself and beyond participation. But true being is intelligible, not as coordinate with the intelligence, but as perfecting it without loss of transcendence. And that it communicates to the intelligence, the gift of being, and fills it with a truly existent essence. I have no idea what any of these words mean. Okay. Um, so he's trying to really draw a line between being and intelligence. And he he wants to say, and he's trying, he's drawing this line through the participation, unparticipated line. So intelligence is a being, it makes itself known. And so there's a duality in, in intelligence. And this is a duality that he's been mentioning ever since Proposition 20, when he first introduced it, where there's on the one hand, the being, right? The what it is. And then there's this activity of intelligence, which is making itself known. So we're gonna see later that, the, that this being that constitutes intelligence is something like a form. Right. So like there's an there's an intelligence that so there's a spirit, there's a daimon that takes care of horses. Make sure that horses always reproduce and so on. It is the, the great shepherd of horses. And so a daimon is a soul that's dependent on a noose, and the noose isn't dependent on something else. Um immediately, right? It, it isn't the an instrument of the henet. Ultimately, everything depends on the law. So the noose, um, so this noose will have, what is it? It's the form of horse. And through its activity, it makes this form of horse known. It not only makes it known, we'll see that it also has effects. It will, in some sense, create the horses. It's the shepherd of horses also in that way. Um, so there's always this duality within news. 
And then you can distinguish within noose between, say, the activity of the noose and the being that corresponds to it. This is the being which is consubstantial with the intelligence. So the activity of knowing uh, what a horse is and the form of horse. Okay. So these are the, the two things. And now he's talking about intelligence itself, right? So not the intelligence of any particular thing. Um, ever since, I mean, Plato drawing on Parmenides, there's this idea that what intelligence basically is, is grasping being, right? It's this ability to know being. And intelligence noose that exists separately is this being that makes itself known, right? And intuitions makes itself known, like, like a sun. And so he's saying, so what would the, the core of this noose be? What would the, the being that it makes known be? It would be the concept of being, right? It would be the form of being, right? If each noose is somehow like a separately existing metaphysics, this very first intelligence it is, as it were, the metaphysics of Parmenides' poem. What is, is, and what is not, is not. And being is everywhere the same. And so that would be the very first news. And Proclus's argument here is saying, but this is a being. This news that produces knowledge of what being is, it is a being. Whereas being itself is not any particular being. It is the principle for which all, because of which all the beings have any being whatsoever. So it is not identical with the being that that noose makes known. It is intelligible. It is known only because it gives being to that noose, but not because it is the being that that noose that makes not. Um, so one way of understanding this is um, wait, so I'm, I'm going to introduce a new um, like another metaphor and another example to explain what I've been saying so far. But are there questions up to now? No. Okay. I mean, yes, but I, whatever. Okay. Continue. I, I'm... So I... Um, so this is, as it were... Um, it's like, in order for you to know anything, you already have to exist, right? This is true about noose, which is this son of knowledge, and it's true about us, and it's true about animals. For any kind of, of knowledge, we already have to exist beforehand, right? And, um, and when we say that, um, you know, that we exist, like our mind exists, like the cogito ergo sum. This is also, uh, you know, we're saying that we have existence full stop. And participating in existence full stop is therefore a condition for knowing. Um, this condition and we can make this more specific, like for instance, for me to be able to know I have to first exist, which means that there has to be a line of ancestors. If this line of ancestors had not existed, I would not, you know, I would not be here and I will not be, be able to know. Um, and there, and I mean, thinking about in terms of like my soul and process of metaphysics, there has to be the whole causal hierarchy prior to me that I depend on. Um, so, and this existence that I always presuppose, that everything always presupposes, is 
itself can never be, um, you know, can never itself um, be known as such. It always exceeds any 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 knower because any knower, any source of knowledge, will will always be a particular being, um, all a particular existent. Dodd's translation. Um, so, for this reason, the universal being is is as it were the constant presupposition of everything. And it's also what makes possible all knowledge. And for that reason, it's called intelligible, but it isn't really intelligible itself. Um, let's, um, so something further that what might be happening here is a certain struggle of Proclus with terms where he feels like he has to call this intelligible but it's no longer actually an object of knowledge in his metaphysics. He has to call it because it's like the traditional way of speaking about it. There might be this might be a part of um, of of what's um, um, of what's behind this. Um, another way. Another another. And, and so he end up, ends up using, you know, it's this purely causal sense of intelligible. Um, it's like the way that he calls the plan for the, for, um, for all the changes in the world, time itself. It doesn't change at all. He just calls it time because of it's the cause of what we call time, right? The cause of the changes we call time. Um, it's, it's eternal. Um, it's like, um, Calling the form of horse, horse. It has nothing to do with horse. I mean, it's their origin and it's the their model, but it's but it has, you know, it has no body parts or anything. Um, the um, yeah, I think that's what. I can um, do to shed light on this. Why don't you ask your questions now? No, I'm, can... I'm going to have to go. That's the problem. Um, oh. we started, okay. But I have to move to some things. Um, this is all about like the the being that we discussed and the with the being life intelligence thing. Yeah, this is all about that being. Mm -hmm. Exactly. This is all about... Which is like the true being. Right. Yeah. And the, your main problem is how it's intelligible. Yeah. Right? And it's like... Some, okay, I understand. Okay, then we'll continue. Yeah, I guess that's... We're going to have to stop just because I'm...